The Woman Who Died Twice. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. July 28, 1945, started like any other for Betty Lou Oliver. Well, almost any other day. The 20-year-old arrived at her place of work, the Empire State Building in New York, and stepped into the elevator where she had been a full-time attendant. It was her last day on the job, she thought, and it would be special. And she was not wrong. It was a special day for her, and one that would be unlike any other in most people's lives. The day would be tragic. It would break records. It would change Betty Lou Oliver forever, and she would go down in history as the woman who cheated death twice. Betty Lou Oliver was born on July 16, 1925, and had a fairly ordinary life. She married young, got a job to support her young family. She became the elevator operator of Elevator 6 in the Empire State Building, and generally enjoyed her job. July 28, 1945 was overcast. Oliver went into the Empire State Building to her elevator and took some time to breathe, saying hello to coworkers and riders as she began her day. Not far away, a B-25 service bomber was embarking on a basic mission which involved bringing servicemen from Massachusetts to LaGuardia Airport in New York City. It would be the final months of World War II, and America was ready for the war to end. The pilot of this B-25 was a hugely experienced captain named William Smith, who had led some of the war's most dangerous missions. By the time Smith arrived in New York, the fog had thickened, significantly reducing visibility. Smith contacted LaGuardia and requested permission to land. He was advised not to land, but for whatever reason, Smith ignored the order and made a turn that brought him over midtown Manhattan. Even still, Smith should have turned left after the Chrysler building, but he didn't. Perhaps disoriented by the fog, he turned right and now his B-25 was among New York's gigantic skyscrapers. At the time, the Empire State Building was the tallest in the world, and Smith crashed right into it. Meanwhile, our friend Betty Lou was in Elevator 6 around the 80th floor. Smith's plane crashed between the 78th and 80th floors, and Smith, the two crew members on board, and 11 people in the Empire State Building immediately died. As disturbing as this tragedy was... The true carnage it left was just as bad. Search crews didn't find Smith's body for two days, as it had traveled down the 80-some floors through an elevator shaft and was in the building's basement. When the plane crashed, understandably, there was chaos. The impact of the crash was felt throughout the building. Shocked employees fled into and out of the rubble and fire, trying to find safety. On the 56th floor, 20 floors from the impact, a woman named Gloria Paul said it felt as if the building was about to topple over. She herself was thrown across the room. According to Therese Fortier-Willig, who worked on the 79th floor, she could see nothing but flames. She described the horrific spectacle of seeing a co-worker named Mr. Fountain catch fire. As the B-25 crashed, parts of the engine flew into the building and weakened the cables of a pair of elevators on the 79th floor. Like we said, Betty Lou Oliver was working on the 80th floor. The crash caused her to be thrown out of her elevator, burned her, and broke her pelvis, back, and neck. Horrible injuries, of course, but survivable. First aid workers helped Betty, placing her on an elevator headed to the ground floor. The plan was get her down from the Empire State Building, and get her treatment. Meanwhile, our other survivor on the 56th floor, Therese Willig, was still in shock over what happened. Years later, Willig describes it as a small universe, akin to being stuck on a small island surrounded by fire. Willig's floor was engulfed in smoke and fire. While someone had managed to open a window and Willig used a handkerchief to protect her from the smoke, several people passed out from the fumes. Everyone was sure they were going to die. So much so that a man named Paul Deering jumped out the window, panicking in the aftermath of the crash and the fire. After him, and still certain her death was near, Willig took the rings off her fingers and threw them out the window. For someone to find, help identify her, come help anyone in the building. Soon, however, firemen arrived on the scene and rescued Willig on her floor. 
The worst was over for Therese Willig, but not for Betty Lou Oliver. Let's take a break. Do you want to learn more about history while reducing your stress or falling asleep? If so, then I have the podcast for you, Calm History. Enjoy curious stories and trivia from history, narrated in a calm voice to help you relax. You'll even hear a survivor of the Titanic share their first-person experience. Just search for Calm History in your podcast player or use the link in the episode notes. And be sure to check out Calm History. Good morning, Sodomites. It's me, your host, Zach Nui Towers, comedian and unofficial sex bird you may have seen on Netflix, Comedy Central, or Grindr. Because let's be honest, I am on that app saturating the cloud with semi-tasteful nudes. Good Morning, Sodomites is a weekly hour-long podcast where I do a deep dive on my guest's sexual journey. That's right. You're going to hear things like How Dan Savage Lost His Virginity, Bob the Drag Queen's Craziest Craigslist Hookup, The Weirdest Thing Margaret Cho Ever Found in Her Butt, and so much more. So pause whatever brilliant show you're listening to right now and go subscribe for free to Good Morning Sodomites wherever you get your podcasts. One more time, that's Good Morning Sodomites with Zach Noe Towers. Hi, hello. hello. How are you? Hello. How are you doing? Are you okay? This you is the okay? check-in. You're here. We're here. We're doing this right now. In this moment. Spill it. <laughs> Spill your That's nuts. how this works. Yeah. <laughs> Just tell us your darkest, deepest, darkest secrets and your social security number. But uh, record it and send it to us because we can't hear you. We can't hear you through your earphones. Maybe they're listening to it out loud. They're just like, they want, they're not ashamed <laughs> to be listening like to us. In the park blasting ghost town. Good for you. Yeah. Good why not? You. Mm-hmm. We want to say hello to anyone who's listening Anyone who supports the show, thank you. Thank you so much. And to our government. Government. We're just we're bootlickers for the government of Ghost Town. We love you. The mayors. In alphabetical order, if you don't understand what the alphabet is. <laughs> Perfect. David Bull. Hello. James Harrington. Hello. Kat Joselle. Hello. Dara Rosenzweig. Hello. Ashley Matson. Hello. And our governor, who's right at the top of the alphabet. Oh, Easy. Absolutely. If you go by first name. We're doing that now. So yeah, we are. Avian Noble. Noble. So if you want early access, no chit chat. You got you time is money. Mm-hmm. Money is power. Absolutely. Power is is everything. That's right. We're motivational speakers now. P.S. That's right. Just uh, close your eyes and visualize. Walk on hot yourself. coals. Exactly. Sit in this room for 12 hours. You don't sweat. get to pee. Yes, yeah, sweat. <laughs> sweat it out. Sweat it out. But if you want early access, no chit chat, you want to go back and listen to bonus episodes, or you want to listen to old episodes with no ads or talk, and you want to you want to jam in a bunch of mm-hmm. weird, random stuff. You know you do. You know you want it. Yeah. You know you like it. You love it. You love it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> be honest, baby. Go to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. I guess let's get back to our regularly scheduled episode. <laughs> so we're back between the 79th and 80th floor where rescuers had placed Oliver on a stretcher and put her in an elevator. Unfortunately, nobody realized that the cables on the elevator had been weakened in the crash. Just as soon as they placed Oliver's stretcher on the elevator, the cables immediately snapped, and Oliver and her stretcher fell through the elevator shaft in the most horrific freefall I can ever imagine. The first aid workers looked down the shaft in complete horror, certain it was the last they would see of Betty Lou Oliver alive. And yet, 75 stories down, 1,000 feet through an Empire State elevator shaft, she survived. But how? Well, that thousand feet of elevator cable had broken away and fallen to the bottom, kind of coiling and pooling. So by the time Oliver landed, the cable was there to kind of provide a soft landing surface for her. Well, softer than the bottom of a concrete elevator shaft. Of course, Oliver suffered further horrific and serious injuries from her fall and was eventually cut from the mangled wreckage of cord and debris. She was in bad shape, but she was alive. It took her eight months to recover fully and remember, horribly ironically, that that day was supposed to have been her last day on the job at the Empire State Building. In fact, before Oliver made a full recovery, about five months after the incident, Betty took an elevator up the Empire State Building, yes, 
back in this old building that she almost died in twice with an elevator inspector who was absolutely astonished that she was willing to even enter the building, let alone get on an elevator and travel up it. Oliver's name was added for the unlikely feat of longest survived elevator fall, a record she still holds today in the Guinness Book of World Records. Her Guinness World Record entry reads, Betty Lou Oliver, USA, survived a plunge of 75 stories over 300 meters or 1,000 feet in a lift in the Empire State Building in New York City, USA, on 28 July 1945, after an American B-25 bomber crashed into the building in thick fog. Oliver lived through what we now know as the Empire State Building crash, which claimed the lives of 14 people and caused $1 million worth of damage, which is about $13 million today, including the destruction of a nearby penthouse art studio. Incredibly, especially for how much damage it did, the New York City firefighters acted quickly, extinguishing the fire in just 40 minutes. It is still the biggest major fire to have been brought under control at such a height. Although the crash made headlines everywhere, the bombing of Hiroshima was a week later, so it took a lot of attention off of this horrible incident. Despite the crash and subsequent fire, which happened on a Saturday, the building was open for business on Monday, mainly because the building itself didn't suffer any structural damage. Eight months later, the U.S. government offered money to the families of the victims. While some accepted it and moved on, Others filed a lawsuit that ultimately led to the implementation of the Federal Tort Claims Act of 1946. This act provides a legal means for compensating individuals who have suffered personal injury, death, or property loss or damage caused by the negligent or wrongful act or omission of an employee of the federal government. So that's a pretty big act still in place today and still gives victims of horrible tragedies like this compensation, which seems fair and just to me. I know what you're thinking, but what of Betty Lou Oliver? What happened to her? Well, after recovering, again, I I don't know if it was a full recovery. I've just, in my research, know that she recovered to go on and, and live a relatively healthy life. She moved to Arizona to live with her husband, Oscar Lee, and stayed out of the media spotlight and public eye completely. Like, there's really very little about this woman besides this incident. She had three children and seven grandchildren and led a pretty good, uneventful life, at least according to her obituary, which is still found online and is one of the few things, aside from any reporting on anything other than the Empire State incident. She died on November 24th, 1999, at 74 years of age. She probably had enough excitement in one day than most of us do in a lifetime. 